as a chapter in the saga of this Catalina issue comes to a close, it's time for the people's voice to be heard. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel today. That's right, we are back on the Catalina issue with the potential extermination of the mule deer on that island. Obviously, as we've expressed in past videos, it has huge implications, not just for Catalina and the residents there, but for the rest of the nation as a whole. But hey, before we get into that, please be sure and like, share, and subscribe to the CRPA TV YouTube channel. It's really helping with the algorithms as we come closer to the 2024 elections. We need to get this information out to as many people as possible. Go ahead and click that notification bell so that you get notified when we come out with these videos and the future videos on litigation and legislation to come. So let's just dive right into this. We, we've already done a video where we went to the island of Catalina to check it out for ourselves. Uh, what we didn't show you, and, and we have more than just this to show you in that video, is that we were able to get some interviews with some of the residents on the island. This is Rick Travis, CRPA's legislative director, conducting these interviews. Go ahead and check it out. Hey folks, I'm with William Flickinger. We're out here on Catalina Island. And what we're talking about today is the conservancy here on Catalina, moving forward with trying to slaughter all the mule deer here in, in this beautiful island. And William has worked for 35 years prior to retiring with the Avalon Harbor Department. He's got to see it all. William, um, I know when we were talking before the interview, you were talking to me about uh, hunting and helping new people learn how to hunt out here on the island. What did you mean by that? Hunting is one of those sports that's dwindling a lot from lack of accessibility. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the guys on the island as they're growing up and they want to go hunting, getting them into their hunter safety courses, getting them through the spider web of paperwork, insurance, policy change with the conservancy mm -hmm. and getting them out in the field, teaching them how to harvest a deer, hunt safely. It's, a, it's been really important. Bree, a little bit about that. So I come over from the mainland and I want to come here to hunt and I go through all the hassle of getting all my equipment on the flyer to come across the channel. When I get here, what am I going to be met with? So the first time you come over here, if you're wanting to hunt, you're gonna to have to come in advance um, because chances are if you come at the time that you're wanting to hunt, um, they may not have tags available. So you oh. have to come out sometimes a month or you know a couple months in advance uh, to exchange your uh, state tags for your private land management tags. Mm -hmm. So that's a trip in and of itself. So I've known people that have driven down from Northern California and have driven all the way down, hopped on the boat, gotten their tags, hopped on another boat and driven all the way up same day just to come back a couple months later and do their actual hunt. And then, you know, obviously the deer aren't huntable in Avalon, so no. that's on the other parts of the island. How hard is it for somebody without a guide service system to get out there to where the deer are at? I mean, it is pretty difficult, especially if you've never been here before and this is your first time here. I mean, for starters um, and other places, you know, you can maybe grab a campsite or something to be able to, you know, sleep for the night and then head out. You're not allowed to do that here. So you have to first stay in a hotel or rent um, a vacation rental in order to come out here and hunt. And then um, just to get up to the gate, like from my house where I live, to go all the way up to the gate, that's a mile and a half hike. Um, just three quarters of the way is straight uphill. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a hike in and of itself. It's a place that I go all the time, but um, imagining carrying all of your equipment and everything just to get to the gate. And then that's where you start your hike. Right. So, I mean, you have to be really physically fit in order to just get up there. Um, you know, most people I see by day two, they have figured out, you know, oh, if I take the golf cart and I drive it up, you know, to the gate and then they start their hike from there, you know, it's a lot, you know, more manageable. So it's going to cost you some money to get out to the hunt itself. And then I noticed today being on the island, been here before, but this is not an easy hunt in the terms of, you know, it's, it's rough chaparral yeah. that you're moving through. Uh, lots of cactuses and fun things to get hung up on. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and which is makes for a great hunt, but also um, the numbers just don't seem to be where the conservancy has asserted recently in the news of thousands of deer. We saw one bison. Yeah. Um, but that was 
pretty much it when it came to big critters bigger than a couple of foxes. So oh, why is that, do you think, that we're just not seeing the deer population? I just don't think that the deer numbers are what they're saying they are. You know, they were throwing around the number 2,000 for a while. Um, I mean, we've gone back there. Good luck finding one. You know, we're not seeing them. Even in their application to the Department of Fish and Wildlife, they did put that the numbers were unknown. Right. Um, so I think that their guess is probably about as good as ours as to how many deer are out there. But no one that I know thinks there's anywhere close to 2,000. And then as far as the economy of the island goes, you know, one of the things that I don't think people realize, deer have been hunted on this island for close to 100 years. Yeah. And there's an economic value to those of you who live on this island in forms of tourism and dollars for your businesses, et cetera. What's that kind of impact going to look like if all of a sudden the deer are just gone? Well, I think that we're already seeing some of that economic impact over here. I know that now that people know about it, I've seen plenty of people that have said that they're not going to come back over here. We've had people on our charters ask us what's going on, uh, what's happening over here. And they've said the same thing, that if the deer are gone, they don't want to come back. It's a magical part of their vacation. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think it will seriously affect a lot of us here in town, but I don't think that it'll affect the Conservancy any. Well, because the Conservancy allegedly has millions of dollars, so. Absolutely. They're not concerned about our tourism. Okay, and what would you say the average island person feels about this? Do you think they lean mostly towards the conservancy or mostly towards protecting the deer and keeping this going? Uh, more people are, you know, towards the deer. I don't know a single person that's actually on the conservancy side other than the people that are getting paid by the conservancy. So would it be safe to say that we, the people of Catalina, are supporting the deer? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So I'm with Johnny Machado. Yes from the at Catalina. He lives here on the islands, been here for a long time. Exactly how long have you been here, Johnny? Uh, 61 years, born here on the island, 1962. <laughs> so you've probably seen a lot of changes since 62. Um, what are some of the changes you've seen to deer population? Well, to be honest with you, uh, I've been hunting since I was eight years old. Uh, my father worked for the Wrigley's and my grandfather, and uh, we did a lot of hunting. That's pretty much what we, Eight, eight, you know, being we didn't have the money, so <laughs> uh, grew up just hunting and fishing on the island. And uh, I'll be even 20 years back, I would go hunting and I would see 60, 70 deer each hike, each hunt. I go out now, you see eight to 10 deer, and I'm working pretty hard. We used to, used to be able to drive out there and just shoot right off the road, just there were deer were everywhere. Um, I think the population of the deer is with the wildlife west hunting and the local hunting every year it's dropped since they've been over here uh, I think they've been here 23 years or so mm -hmm. the wildlife west uh, have seen a decline every year that I've go out hunting and it, it's it's harder you have to get out and do some real hiking and uh, to find a, the better quality deer uh, they are way healthier than I've ever seen because uh, you know the population has dropped. Uh, so the deer are, are very, very healthy here on the island, right? especially right now. Uh, that seems to be actually the opposite of what the Cal Catalina Conservancy is uh, pushing forward in their messaging of that, you know, there's these massive deer herds. They're doing massive damage. I mean, personally today, I've spent the day going throughout the island, folks, and didn't see one deer, not one. Um, and I'm pretty good at finding deer. So, you know, where do you think this is coming from that we have one group saying there's thousands of deer and yet from uh, the locals and people here, it doesn't seem like there's thousands of deer. <laughs> no, there's not. Uh, I think a uh, lot of the pictures that they've been given to the press are pictures they've taken three, four years ago during the drought, which mm -hmm. obviously the deer were coming into town, you know, the resources weren't out there for them. Uh, the deer were coming into town and they were looking a little on the thin side, which they do, it goes through right. phases, but they come back and, you know, and I think uh, <laughs> when they're, to be honest, when they're counting their numbers, I think they're looking uh, at the same deer every night, you know. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, <laughs> just from a hunter's point, you know, I think this could be the best place in the world to hunt. <laughs> I wish we keep it a secret, but right. if you manage it, and keep the number at a good and keep doing what they're doing as far as the wildlife west and the local hunting uh you can keep that number and they're not doing no damage i mean this 
you know, I mean, the, us right. people do more damage to <laughs> this island than the, right. than the deer do. I mean, it's it's pretty obvious. And I, I, to me, my point, I think my opinion on this whole thing is it's the conservancy is doing it just that they need something to do. They're done with their fox population came back, their eagles came back, and now they just they're going on to another project to spend money. That's a, it's it's nothing to do with the deer ruining this island it's just another project for them to in my opinion you know so okay well thank you for being on thank you very much all right take care okay so where do we go from here uh it is the the next level of advocacy you know we were able to get uh those interviews from people on the island but uh, it was necessary to make sure that the government agencies that have the ability to issue these permits uh be heard by the people so uh a little point of clarification here, because where this ended up manifesting is the, the Fish and Game Commission meeting in San Diego. It's not actually the commission that issues these permits. It's the Department of Fish and Wildlife in California. However, the Department of Fish and Wildlife in California has no means for people to communicate or advocate or bring forth these terrible things. So this does end up manifesting yesterday at the Fish and Game Commission meeting in San Diego. Let's go ahead and check out some of the interviews we were able to get from people at the meeting. Hey everybody, we are here at the Handlery Hotel in San Diego, California for the California Fish and Game Commission meeting. The topic today is the conservancy of Catalina Island and the potential slaughter of the mule deer there on the island. Uh, I'm here with uh, Sylvia Lugo. Uh, Sylvia, why don't you go ahead and just tell us what actually brings you here today and where you came from? Well, I drove down from Los Angeles. I live on the Palos Verdes Peninsula and I came to ask the, the CDFW to deny the petition that the Conservancy has set forward to slaughter the, the mule deer on the island. I asked the CDFW for full public disclosure during the decision-making process. The Conservancy's application must be denied. So what, what is the uh, interest that drives you here? What, do you have a background in hunting or, or what, what drives you down here today? Well, it started off just a personal story. I was married on the island 30 years ago, the deer are part of the island. I go every year with my family and friends and um, we spend our vacation time there and the deer are a large part of that. So it's a tender moment, it's a family participation moment and the thought of not having the deer there and to lose them to such um, waste, disgusting waste, in such a wasteful way, um, it, I had to say something. I had to say, I'm going to stand up for the deer. There should be a better way to call. There's a big difference between calling and annihilation. And I understand, you know, there's no natural predators there, but hunters could take care of the situation, in my opinion. So I came to just sort of ask uh, the commission here to deny the application. Well, that's certainly reflective of uh, the, the sentiment from a lot of people on Catalina Island right now. Uh, from your perspective, being, I, I guess, what they would consider a mainlander, uh, what are some of the potential consequences that we could see if this permit is granted or if the Conservancy just kind of decides to do it without a permit anyways? Well, for, for me personally, I can only speak for myself, but my observation would be if they continue with this plan and, and slaughter the deer, I personally won't be able to go back to the island. For me, it will be a, an island of death. They're, they have no plan to pick up the carcasses. It, it's going to cause an ecological um, unbalanced situation there. In the long term, my dollars are not going to be spent there. It's going to affect tourism. And I'm going to tell everyone I know, like I've been telling, what's going to happen. And if it does take place, I feel bad for the local merchants, but they need to stand up too and, and defend um, the, the lives of the deer. Uh, with us now is Ali Deza. Uh, Ali, I just wanted to kind of get your perspective on this. What's driven you here today? Uh, my family and I have a really long history on the island. My grandparents met there back in the 40s. My dad spent a lot of his childhood over there. He even lived over there as a teenager and worked over there. Um, I spent my childhood going there from the time I was a few months old. Anyway, um, I now rent the same house every year that my grandpa rented and would take us over. And now I go with my family every year. So we really love the island and we were just over there. I mean, we're there all the time, but we were there recently and came back and upon our return, we heard about this deer issue. and. We were just completely like enraged and kind of confused that this was something we didn't hear about while we were on the island. So I guess this is new news to all of us, but it's one of those things that it's like the more you dig into this, the less sense it makes. It's like, it sounds crazy and then you keep digging and it just gets crazier. Um, how the 
conservancy that's supposed to protect and uh, care for wildlife is out there spending millions to hire sharpshooters to kill them and leave them there, I can't fathom or understand. I'm like, make it make sense. Well, yeah, I guess when you're when you're dedicated to flora and fauna and uh, you seem to be uh, taking a more proactive effort to, um, you know, you know, conserve the the flora uh the fauna kind of falls by the wayside i did notice as you got up for public comment something you you did mention was uh the efficacy of exactly that uh the proposal to uh, contract sharpshooters from helicopters we don't want to see these deer slaughtered something i'd like to point out is catalina island conservancy has constructed a chart on their website measuring a variety of removal methods there's no information citing sources studies or research supporting these claims how do they determine that being shot from a helicopter rates as very good at minimizing the deer's suffering as opposed to hunting, which qualified as fair? Uh, which scientist was up there asking the deer these questions? How was this measured? Uh, quite honestly, probably using firearms that aren't even legal in California, it would be a an organization brought in from out of state. Um, any kind of hunting in the background, why is that a particular issue for you? I mean, I understand that there has to be some kind of compromise. So hunting seems like the logical solution to be able to take care of the deer population, which to be honest, I'm still not convinced or even a problem to anybody other than the conservancy. I've spent a lot of time up in the hills and on the island and there's plenty of times where I don't even see a deer. So I'm like, where are they? The way that they painted it, it seems like they're just like jumping out of the bushes all over the island and they're just not. Um, so I would much prefer hunting where these people are using the animal for meat or for recreation or its families or the history of hunting on the island. All of that I can respect is just specifically the brutal manner of shooting them from helicopters. It's the waste of the donor money. It's the leaving the carcasses to rot. It's well, it's I, inhumane. yeah, I can tell you the hunting community does have a very long history of uh, maintaining populations uh, in a responsible and ethical way. Uh, I'm here with Robin Cassidy, who was one of the people who commented at the meeting. Robin, first of all, thank you very much for being here with us today. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm just sort of curious. Obviously, we, we have a little bit of a crowd here. What is it that drove you here today uh, in regards to the conservancy on Catalina Island? Well, uh, the, a group of us here from the Coalition to Stop the Slaughter of Catalina Deer are all passionate longtime islanders who are deeply invested in the long-term health of the island and uh, very, very concerned about the uh, short-term radical measures that the Conservancy is proposing right now on multiple levels that were all mentioned here at the meeting today. Um, and we're here to uh, really speak up for our views. The role that Catalina deer could play in a species experience a serious, serious health threat on the mainland United States cannot be ignored. Alternative methods of population control must not be left unexplored. Public engagement is essential to fulfill legal obligations and create public trust in our decision makers. Your role as policymakers can serve as a shining example of responsible wildlife management policy. Thank you for your time. This permit must be denied. So what is so radical about that? Let's get into your comment. What was your comment really to the, the conservancy? Um, well, my comments specifically were, I think that there's an extremism that has been triggered by their radical solution of complete eradication of the deer. Um, and my comment to that is that rather than having, a, you know, simply a uh, opposal to that, that what's being missed in all of this is the very practical solutions to every point that they're making um, regarding the reestablishment of a successful hunting program. They have gutted the hunting program on the island. Us as islanders have a long-term knowledge of the conservancy, the way the conservancy has worked. They have a history and uh, within the uh, uh, management of the Catalina Island Conservancy of, of a very, very quick turnover of their personnel. We've seen uh, a gutting of the uh, the hunting program, as I've said. We've seen, um, you know, this radical solution when we feel that longer-term science, longer-term studies are all possible. Well, that's certainly something that we've heard a lot of here today is where exactly is the science, uh, but what about the consequences, right? Um, you know, you, you can make some very logical assumptions just as far as tourism on the island, uh, obviously the, the population, you make a good point, you know, the, the hunting community has a great record 
uh, or track record of you know maintaining populations uh, and keeping them under control. What are some of the potential consequences that you see from the eradication of these mule deer on the island? Well, I think one of the gaps in their arguments is that they've uh, expressed a lot of concern about things that actually as islanders we're concerned about as well. We are concerned about plant health. We experienced a major wildfire in 2007. And so we feel that there's a gap between these events and these threats and the actual uh, application of uh, blame to the deer. So I feel by focusing on the deer rather than focusing on um, more moderate solutions that will actually address these issues, one of the main issues again going on to the fire risk is the pro timing proposal of this uh, eradication is to use live fire, even if they're lead-free bullets, on a rocky island at the height of our fire season is the absolute epitome of recklessness. They, in and of themselves, uh, stand a major chance of causing a major disaster. So our safety concerns, all of these things um, can be, in addition to people being everywhere on that island. This is an inhabited island. They're treating it as if it's one of the northern channel islands where these eradications have taken place before. This is an island that has people in it. As long-term islanders, I've been hiking the island for over 50 years, and I have never stopped running into people at all times of day, especially during the times that, um, that they're uh, proposing to do their hunts. Um, there is no practical way, in spite of um, their reassurances, that they are going to be able to enact safety protocols that will make sure that a human disaster um, is not going to ensue. So there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> And I'm here with Gary Brennan today, who is the president of the San Diego County Wildlife Federation. Amongst others, Gary, you, you got you actually kind of got a lot of accolades. You've been uh, training. Uh, you're you're an experienced hunter. Uh, you've been in the uh, the hunters education business for a while now. Sure. You 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 kind of been in this area for a very long time. First of all, thank you for being with us today. No, it's great to be here again. Absolutely. I, I kind of wanted to appeal to your expertise and and just wisdom in this community. Uh, what are your thoughts? What drives you here to? <laughs> advocate for the deer on Catalina uh, and what do you see coming out of this? Well I mean out of this meeting we're not probably going to see anything because it's kind of not the venue there's a lot of people who got up and vented this morning uh, both uh, for it and against it. Um, we're completely against the call on the island because of this lack of science, actual science, a lack of DFG or DFW participation and it's just the wrong thing to do. When there's other options uh, for removing or reducing the herd on the island, so legal options. So. Well, there, there, there is the background <clears throat> argument of you know conserving the mule deer population, not just the potential on Catalina, but really the potential uh, uh, for the rest of the United States. You've got uh, chronic wasting disease uh, sure. that's sort of plaguing a lot of a lot of deer, uh, and one of the arguments here is that they're. They're in solitary over there on Catalina. By taking out that, you're essentially taking out the, the potential reserves that you might yes. need to use. Seed stock. Uh, so, so <laughs> it, I mean, amongst others, uh, how big of a deal is that? Well, I mean, I think it is a, a huge deal. I mean, chronic wasting, we've had one or two cases where they've been reported in the state, but it's been stopped before it got into the wildlife areas and stuff. Uh, it's devastating, and now it's, it's a mule deer population, uh, and you know, so it would be good in the West, uh, but we have our own problems with overpopulation of bear, overpopulation of mountain lions in the state, and our deer population, personally, I believe, has taken a hit, a really bad hit, and we're going to get to a point where it's not going to be recoverable, even in our state, if we keep, if we don't take the predators and put them under control. But um, they don't even know what the habitat can support over there. Uh, our our fish and wildlife hasn't been over there to really do anything since what, 2007, I guess it is. And um, our regional director down here in San Diego is in charge of the region that includes Catalina, Region 5, um, totally unaware of what was going on. So this is thing, whole thing is being handled way too high on the food chain when it comes to DFW, when it should be down in the trenches where all the work gets done. Now, um, one thing I did notice is uh, the, the director wasn't here this morning during all the comments. I don't know if he's actually showed up yet or not, but, um, hmm, you know, <laughs> I don't know if there's a reason for it. A lot of people made it from Sacramento for this meeting this morning, so. Is, well, help, help enlighten me here, you know, for, for those outside the hunting community, for those who don't handle firearms in general, uh, a logical conclusion that they can come to uh, is that hunters 
kill animals. True. Uh, one of the conver or you know, on a lot of comments, a lot of the arguments that we're seeing here uh, is that we can maintain a healthy herd through hunting. Can you explain uh, really quick exactly how that is? How can you call uh, a hunt uh, uh, the hunting community a conservation community? Hunting is a wildlife management tool used by the Fish and Wildlife Agencies to bring the overpopulation of a species of animal down to just above or what the habitat can support. And in order to do that, they have to do studies and figure out what the habitat can support. And now if there's an abundance of wildlife, but they're making it hard for hunters to get in there, they're not using a utility that they could be using uh, effectively. Uh, for instance, it's about $6,000 to go over there to take a deer or two. I think you're allowed to if you go to the, the one guide that's available for the island. You have to pay enormous fees, daily passes. Uh, gosh, if you take a truck over there, you got to pay for a vehicle pass. If you take your trailer with it, you got to pay for both of those. So when you're talking $6,000 just to go over there to try to help them with a problem, it seems like they should be just the opposite, where they're paying us to come over and eradicate the deer so they don't have to have helicopters flying around the island and, and taking them that way. Um, another thing they could do, they could work with Fish and Wildlife, and they could say, hey, you know, can we set Catalina Island as our own deer zone? And when we set the deer zone, can we set or get a population of tags? And then just have a season where they come over, and it could be throughout the year. It could be a 365 if they wanted to bring it down to a management alert. But total eradication is not needed. I mean, it's a we all know, and it's all been reported, that it is a herd that was introduced by the landowners. Okay, well, that was over 100 years ago. And the herd's still there, the island's still there, and the flowers and plants are still there. Okay, um, so I, until we get a real good scientific research done by the Department of Fish and Wildlife who controls the animals because the animals do not belong to the Conservancy so they belong to the people of the state and it's managed by the Fish and Wildlife so Fish and Wildlife should be in there trying to figure out how many deer there are and if there's a problem. Uh, we have Paul Dugas here who uh, also came to attend the meeting. Paul uh, thank you for being with us by the way today. Sure good morning. Uh, so what is it exactly that drove you down here today? I serve on the San Diego County Wildlife Federation, and we look at all these types of issues around the state, and this one was kind of blindsided us because the state of California always is into conservation and managing wildlife without, in fact, they cut back hunting permits in favor of animals because they just don't like hunters in California, it seems. And so for the state to get involved in just wiping out all the Bambies out on Catalina Island just doesn't make any sense to us. So we really started to drill down on this issue. Well, uh, I mean, being involved with the San Diego County Wildlife Federation, I know that there are a lot of projects that go into that. Um, uh, I know that there's a lot of projects in conjunction with the Department of Fish and Wildlife that the Federation uh, has been a part of. Uh, I'm just sort of curious, one of the main arguments that we're seeing here today is just sort of uh, where's the science kind of an argument. Um, so, uh, I mean, as, as somebody who serves on the Federation, uh, how much science are you used to seeing when any project is, is undertaken and how much science do you see on this? Generally there's way too much science in my opinion because it takes years and years to get anything done because of those scientific and research studies they like to base things on. But this one's not based on science which is interesting because there haven't really been any good studies that have been performed out on that island in a long time. Nothing's up to date. You know, some of the suggestions that we're hearing is that we just kind of put a halt uh, to any uh, potential permits here so that that science can be done. Uh, one of the things that we see throughout California as well as the rest of the nation uh, is the hunting community really being brought in as a tool to help regulate herds. Do you see that as a, as a potential here? And what do you see as the potential consequences uh, if this herd is eradicated on Catalina? Well, that herd's been out there, my understanding is it's been out there a hundred years, and the gene pool that's in that herd is a really very good gene pool that should be preserved. And what, what we've tried to push them for is to allow more hunting permits out there if they want to reduce the size of that herd that's out there and make it manageable. But they've 
cut back on permits because California doesn't like hunters in the first place. So we're just trying to get them to open that zone up to more hunting if they want to reduce the size of the herd. Uh, we are here with uh, Bill Gaines. Bill, you are a staple in the community. I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Uh, you do represent a large part of the, uh, the hunting and fishing community. So go ahead and let us know uh, exactly who you are and what drove you down here today. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, Bill Gaines technically a lobbyist, but I'm with Gaines and Associates. And, you know, I am technically a lobbyist, a contract lobbyist, but the only issues I work on have to do with wildlife conservation and hunting opportunity. That is it. Stay in my lane, stay focused on what I'm very familiar with, what I know a lot about, and, and what I care most about, frankly. So on, on issues such as the Catalina proposed eradication of deer, I represent California Bowman Hunter State Archery Association, California Deer Association is another one of my clients, and I have about 13 or 14 other wildlife conservation clients, all of whom are adamantly opposed to the proposed eradication of deer on Catalina. Well, so you, you got up there and gave a comment, uh, one that I found particularly interesting. You know, obviously you have a lot of arguments of, you know, we, we want the deer population here. Uh, we don't want them, you know, uh, uh, destroyed in an unethical way. But uh, something that you brought forth was your experience and your wisdom from doing this for so long. Uh, your primary argument was, um, you know, that there just wasn't a whole lot of science here. So it's critical that California's resource managers get this decision right. I've met with the Conservancy. I've met with department leadership a few times on this, met with independent scientists and a lot of others. And the one common denominator that came out of all of those meetings is we do not have the science right now. I urge, there's no time limit on this. I urge California's resource managers, pump the brakes and go out, get the best available of science and make the decision based on that science. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, in working with the, with the commission, with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, exactly how much science is done for projects like these and how much is it lacking here? I, I think it'd be safe for me to say that out of everybody in that room, I've been around the longest, and that includes the, the, the agency folks, that includes, the, you know, the private parties, certainly the people that, that do this for a living, so to speak. I've been working commission meetings and working closely with the Department of Fish and Wildlife since 1992. It's 31 years, right? I don't think anybody else can say that. But the reason I bring that up is because when I started working in this field years and years ago, you didn't hear the term best available science very often. I mean, even the commission was a bunch of hook and bullet guys. I mean, that, that's just the way it was then. Times have changed. Over those 30 years, as I continue to work with the department and the commission both, I have seen the need for best available science to drive wildlife management decisions increase and increase and increase. I'll give you some examples. The wild, the wild sheep management plan that the department's been working on for five, six years now has gone out for peer review twice. And it's still not out for public review because they're still digging in to make sure they get the best available science. Same thing with the elk management plan. There's $10,000 projects that the department, you know, won't approve these days unless they know that they've got the best available science to drive their decision as to whether or not they should fund those. So it's a very good thing that, that this commission and this department are making wildlife management decisions that we, they manage in public trust based on science. I'm a hunter and, and a conservationist myself, and it's not only for myself, but for the organizations that I represent. Science and, and making decisions based on science has always been our number one priority. We like the, hunt, well, we like the hunting opportunity, right? You know, but we care about the health of the species, species first. Right, and, and so we've always lived and died by the science. If the science says reduce the limits, perhaps even close the season, we support that. Even though we don't like it, we'll support that. So, so what are, I mean, in your experience, uh, I don't know how often this has happened, but what are some of the negative consequences of going into projects like these that you've seen with, without enough science? This specific issue with the, the proposed eradication of deer by the Conservancy you know, on Catalina Island. I've worked thousands of issues over the last 30 years. This one has got to be the most controversial one that I've ever worked on and the most highly publicized one. I mean, we've got newspapers not only from Catalina, but nationwide and international media coming to report on this. It's critical that the department get this right and they get it right based on the best available science. Well, and then let's talk about the hunting community in general. You know, uh, from the outsider's perspective, uh, you can view a hunter simply as uh, a person that kills an animal. 
um, I, I'm sure you, uh, you know, along with the hunting community, put uh, the, the herd and, and its health uh, in very high regard. Can you go into that a little bit? What is it? What is the ethics uh, of the hunting community? And why is it that the hunting community is being looked at as a tool to make sure that this mule deer population stays healthy? Absolutely. I mean, first of all, there's laws on the books that, that say that if you are going to take a game animal, you know, you have to put the edible meat to good use. That's the wanton waste provisions, right? You know, every hunter that I know, unless it has to do with predators, which is a whole different issue, every hunter that I know only hunts those species that he puts on the table to eat. Yeah. And, and, and in this case, what the Conservancy is proposing, is that, that they, they aerial gun all these animals and they leave them alive because of the expense of moving them, which it flies right in the face of, of you know, hunters you know, and what we do when we're hunting animals. Now to answer your question, there is a right number of deer, whatever that number is, that can, that can coexist with native plants on the, on the island of Catalina. We know there's a number out there. There's been no science done to try to determine what that number is. Once we determine what that number is, if we do the proper studies to do so, we can use hunting as a tool where hunters can come in via various means, including you know the guiding outfit that is out there right now, and hunt those animals down to whatever that science-based number is that is appropriate for coexisting with the native plants on Catalina. I think, it, I think uh, at the end of the day, uh, it is painfully obvious that the majority of people here don't want to see the annihilation of these mule deer. However, you are going up against the conservancy that does have influence. So while this chapter of advocacy did come to a close at the commission meeting, the advocacy certainly doesn't stop there. We are going to continue fighting, and the way that we are going to fight is to press the commission and the Department of Fish and Wildlife to get some more scientific data. Uh, I'm sure the commission will come out with the video from that, uh, that meeting. It's not available yet, but when it does, we will let you know. Go ahead and watch. Watch the comments. Watch the commissioners. It's the science that certainly seems to be lacking in this situation, and we're going to continue and advocate uh, and follow along as the story unfolds. And as always, guys, if you like these videos, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe to the channel. If you want to follow along with this, check out our channel. If you haven't seen the two previous videos that we've put on it to get some more context, go ahead and give those a watch. Hit that notification bell so that you get notified when we come out with the next one. Thanks, guys, and we'll see you in the next video.